I'm Alan Kieswetter. Uh, I'm a scholar at the Middle East Institute, a consultant with CNO Resources, and like our guest, uh, uh, Ambassador David Newton, uh, I'm a retired Foreign Service officer who specializes in the Middle East. We're, we're particularly honored to have Ambassador Newton with us today. This is a special day in Iraq, uh, the day that the uh, U.S. troops officially withdraw from the cities in which uh, Prime Minister Meleki has designated his sovereignty day. Uh, Ambassador Newton has been associated with Iraq for a long time and in many ways. Uh, he was our first ambassador to Iraq uh, in 1984. Uh, he also has headed Radio Free Iraq uh, for six years being its first director. He's a longtime scholar of the Middle East, a longtime diplomat uh, that has dealt with various parts of the Middle East. And so with that introduction, I'd like to introduce okay. David Iraq, a personal view. Okay. You can see I've been around a long time, maybe <laughs> too long, but I would like to thank the Rumi Forum for inviting me. Uh, I had the pleasure of making a trip to Turkey with the Maryland Institute for Dialogue a couple of years ago, a wonderful trip. And I have a great admiration for what they're trying to do, and I only wish that having spent so many years in the Arab world that I could see more of this spirit of tolerance uh, uh, exhibited in, in the Arab countries, and I hope it will be in the future. Uh, I brought along a few things uh, that I thought might be worth keeping. Uh, a general map of Iraq, because I think, uh, the, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, but if you look at the little one, you can see, uh, in general, the population distribution. Now, of course, a lot of it's mixed in the cities. But one striking thing is the relatively small area actually occupied by the Sunnis. The other uh, interesting thing, of course, and this was a very important factor in the war with Iran, that the population is almost entirely in the eastern half of the country, except for this very narrow valley of the Euphrates that runs off into Syria. Uh, it's a country with a quite a mixed population, uh, with a long history. We can talk about it if you would like to. But uh, let me go on to say uh, some of the obvious points uh, why Iraq is important for us and why it's important uh, for, for the West and for the world. And of course, the most important reason f is for the world economy is the oil in Iraq. Iraq is not only the world's, has the world's third largest reserves, but it is the least well explored of any of these major countries. And there's very good prospects that there's a lot more oil in Iraq oil that's also very easy to extract. So it's a country with great potential. Uh, ironically, uh, uh, before oil, I would say Iraq was probably one of the most godforsaken, miserable places in the world. Uh, terrible climate, poverty, disease, and so forth. And maybe one of the most fateful decisions was made a hundred years ago when a uh, <coughs> up-and-coming British politician by the name, first sea lord by the name of Winston Churchill decided to switch the, the dreadnoughts of the British fleet from Welsh coal, which was easily available and secure, to Persian oil. And the, the, Iraq, uh, the British, in truth, went into Iraq in 1914 simply to secure the Abadan refinery in Iran, and the easy way, easiest way to get in was to go in through Iraq. The other reason, of course, is Iraq is a major state in the Middle East. I always thought of, if you will, Iraq and uh, Egypt in terms of the Eastern Arab world are kind of the bookends of the, of the region and have been major rivals uh, through, through centuries. Uh, we never paid much attention to Iraq because uh, after the 58 revolution because it turned uh, unfriendly not really under Soviet control by any means, but nevertheless not friendly. And of course we had Iran as our, as our favored uh, ally in the region uh, to provide the ground troops for the, for the Cold War. But with the collapse of Iran, of course, uh, Iraq began to look a lot more attractive uh, and the Iraqis began to behave in a somewhat different way. Saddam said that uh, he wanted to be different, and I think what he really wanted was respectability. He, he was envisioning himself as the, 
the new Nasser, the leader of the Arab world, and uh, also the leader of the non-aligned movement, and we thought, we hoped, that he might, uh, uh, he might behave in more responsible ways. But of course, our immediate problem at the time was the very unpleasant, uh, dangerous, and violent regime under Ayatollah Khomeini and our, and our fears for our friends in the Gulf, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and so forth. Uh, so we've really gotten ourselves back into Iraq since 1980, and we are really in it <laughs> right now, and I think we'll be in it for some time to come. Uh, as a country, I, I, I see several important characteristics of the country that uh, people don't talk about very much, but I think are, are relevant. Number one, there's a great deal of confusion about the three terms of Iraq being a country, being a state, and being a nation. Uh, my good friend Peter Galbraith has written extensively on the, that Iraq is an artificial creation of, of 1920. Uh, and uh, is breaking up and should be allowed to break up. I don't really agree with that. If you look at Iraq on the map, it is a natural country. It's the country of the two rivers. It's been a country, a distinct country, since for f almost 5,000 years, ancient civilizations. Uh, and it has natural borders, uh, the mountains in the north, Turkey, mountains in the east, Iran and then four Arab countries which surrounded in the west and south uh, in desert. And in the middle you have this uh, reasonably arable state uh, watered by the two rivers. But uh, Iraq only has been a state now for almost 90 years, but that's true. It's true even of Turkey itself. Uh, it was part of the Ottoman Empire along with Syria, along with Jordan, uh, and Saudi Arabia is also a new, a new state. But the real issue is Iraq a nation. And when it was founded, if you remember your history, the British brought in King Faisal to be the king. And Faisal famously said, I'm the, the ruler of a country called Iraq, but I can't find anyone who calls himself an Iraqi. But I think over 90 years, there is a distinct, certainly when I was there in the mid to late 80s for four years, there was a distinct often strong feeling of nationalism among among Iraqis. And I think it's hard to see when you have the ethnic conflict uh, and, you know, when a, a Shia Arab and a Sunni Arab are trying to kill each other, uh, it's very difficult for, the, for, them, for them to remember that they're both Iraqis. But when they when the violence dies down, I think the sense of being a nation has come back. I don't want to exaggerate this point too much, but I, there certainly is a lot of uh, ethnic and uh, religious conflict, whatever you want to call it, in Iraq, but I think there is a, a sense of nation. Iraq is also an, an interesting place, uh, and if you look on the, uh, this one I think very interesting statistic. These statistics, uh, the top of them show that uh, Iraq and, and Afghanistan in many ways are quite similar. But then you get down and you see some real differences. Uh, and one of the first one, the first one you see is urban population. Iraq is 67 percent urban, yet Iraq is one of the most tribal countries in the Middle East and you have this uh, urbanized tribalism in Iraq, which is a strange phenomenon. Uh, and you have almost two distinctive groups of people in Iraq. Iraq, when I was there certainly, had perhaps the most moderate, well-educated, westernized, even intermarried middle class of any Arab country. Uh, at the same time, the, the cities which had grown tremendously at that time, Baghdad was one quarter of the country in population, was full of people who'd come in from the countryside and were still basically tribesmen, even though they were urban. So you had this kind of urban tribalism, which is, certainly exists in other countries, but I think is particularly strong in this country. Now, of course, the middle class didn't have the weapons, and. Uh, they, many of them have fled, three to four million have fled, but this tradition still exists and you can find many well-educated Iraqis. Uh, and you can see other great differences if you look on these statistics uh, that shows Iraq is still a pretty well-developed country. Life expectancy, 70 years versus 45. 
uh, many fewer children, although the total fertility rate, of course, the, the number of children per woman of childbearing age, and per capita GDP five times, you know, un unemployment less than half. These figures, of course, may not be accurate, but the, uh, but the ratios are probably accurate. Look at electricity production, 36 to 1, roughly. Uh, Iraq is a pretty well-developed country, and the middle class has the ability to come back, even though it's, it's pretty battered. Uh, I think you all know the, the ethnic makeup pretty well of Iraq. The Shia Arabs, 55, 60 percent. Kurds, 20 percent, roughly. Sunni Arabs, only 18 percent. Uh, Two percent. Uh, some of you may have heard different figures. I think the Iraqi Turkmen front uh, figures are quite high, but the Turkmen's are probably only about 2 percent in Iraq. The Christians are a couple of percent and are certainly shrinking. Uh, some of those uh, Kurds and Turkmen, of course, are, also, are not all Sunnis. Some of them are Shia. Uh, another characteristic of the country, of course, coming back again is the antipathy between uh, Arabs and Kurds. Uh, the Kurds have a history, particularly under Saddam, of really brutal mistreatment. Uh, my argument is, and uh, Peter Galbraith would probably disagree with me, that with their heart, the Kurds would love to be independent. And when they had a referendum, they voted overwhelmingly for independence. Uh, but for the elite or for the leaders, they realize that the current conditions, if they continue, are probably the best possible conditions for the, uh, for the Kurds in Iraq, and that is de facto independence or full autonomy, whatever you want to call it, but also a chance to participate in the larger state of Iraq with its oil wealth and its potential. If you think what Kurdistan would be uh, like as an independent state, I mean, we all, all know how, how, how Turkey feels about this, but it wouldn't be only Turkey. There would be th three or four unfriendly states surrounding it. It would be landlocked. Uh, even though there's some uh, oil up around Kirkuk, 80 percent of the oil is in the south, so there would be a limited possibility for oil and perhaps or closed borders, no open airspace. It wouldn't make much sense for the uh, for the Kurds to be formally independent. I mean, they're now they have full autonomy, they have their own flag, their own parliament, they have their own army in effect. So they have, on a de facto basis, pretty much all the necess necessary elements. Uh, and as long as they can uh, be part of Iraq but not be ruled by Iraq, I think they have the best possible uh, arrangement. Uh, as far as the Shia majority is concerned, first of all, the Shia population of Iraq is only a couple of centuries old. There's, there's an interesting story how it came about, but uh, if you want to ask it uh, as a question, fine, but it's, it's a little bit off the subject. I have never felt that in general that the Shia in general are all that religious. When you get outside the two holy cities, which still even now have a strong Persian presence, you get out in the, the tribes of the south and even in cities like Basra, you find that, I'm not saying they're unreligious, but they're not all that strongly religious. And I think what you've seen in the last couple of years, a certain reaction to the extremism of the Shia militias and the, and the people who've gone around killing people or, or, uh, or mistreating women and so forth in the name of Shia Islam. Uh, I also think that you need to remember that uh, the Shia of Iraq are Arabs. Traditionally, the Arabs of Iraq have not liked Persians. Persians don't like the Iraqi Arabs either, so it's mutual. And I think I'm not saying there isn't an issue of, per of Iranian influence there, but I think you could easily exaggerate the risks, and I don't think you would see anything like an, an Islamic revolution in Iraq. A couple of other points, uh, and an obvious point, the Iraqis have no real experience with democracy. They have no experience with the give and take, with the, uh, with the necessary compromises and the tolerance that you need in a democracy. You could, uh, I saw this recently with the municipal elections up in Mosul. Mosul, like Baghdad, is divided by a river, and it's now divided uh, 
between peoples in a way with Kurdish influence very strong west of the river, Arabs uh, on the, we the west of the river then fades off into the desert, so it's heavily Arab. Uh, when the previous national elections with the boycott of the Sunnis, the Kurds took over control of the government and dominated it. In the municipal elections recently, these, the Arabs, the Sunni Arabs voted, and they won a reasonably narrow majority, and they immediately expelled the Kurds from all the offices, all function of government. So you went from one extreme to the other, and, a pos and the possibility for some kind of living together and compromise was lost. Finally, uh, uh, talked about the tribalism and so forth. Iraqis have long had, and I'm sorry to say, a well, probably well documented reputation in the Arab world for being violent. Mm -hmm. uh, so, a little bit like Colombians in, in uh, northern Latin America. Uh, and there, there has been a lot of violence in their history. But the Iraqis are also a very tough and resilient people. And uh, the violence may be the downside, but this toughness, and you've seen in many examples of Iraqis now in the effort to come back as a country who have stood up in the face of great danger and really fought to get their country back on its feet to their credit. So uh, this is two sides of a personality, if you will. Uh, now, to turn to the war itself, uh, I mean, I don't think there's much point talking about all the bad decisions made to go to war. I have often said there were four willful blunders that we made, uh, false reasons for the war, presenting it as a war of necessity, uh, cooking the intelligence, you know, wrongly sizing the force, and finally, no planning, willfully no planning for the post-war situation. We then made things worse by uh, dismissing the senior Baathis and by uh, eliminating the army. There was a dispute over, you know, uh, Jerry Burma said the army had disintegrated a anyway, but I think the real issue was that the way it was d done dishonored the entire army and created a desire. A, almost a desire for revenge, and you gave trained people with access to weapons reasons to come after you. Uh, so whether the army was effective or not, it wasn't, but there was a possibility and it was an effort to, to, uh, to uh, start a cadre again. In any case, we finally got it right. Uh, I think actually the first one to get it right was General Odierno, who not only began to use proper counterinsurgency, but began to insist that all the units followed the same principles and the same policies before that one division of one brigade might be taking a very hard line and another brigade, like over the original brigade or the division that uh, General Petraeus had up in Mosul, is, real one, is really reaching out to the Iraqis trying to find people to work with. Meanwhile, another division or another brigade is there rounding up every, every military age male in Iraq and throwing them into uh, into bad conditions. And of course, Petraeus then with a great intellect and with the help of a lot of very good people has really, uh, has really done a great deal. Fortunately, we now have, I think it's a very good thing we have dates to leave. Dates can be changed, but the, uh, but the, I think my feeling is once you get these dates and you start a process of leaving, it's more likely to accelerate than slow down. It creates its own momentum. So I think it's very likely that we will follow these dates. August of next year, they have uh, all combat troops gone, and then by the end of, of, uh, of the following year, everybody out. Now, in truth, not everybody will be out. First of all, one of the things uh, I heard yesterday the Army is doing is uh, turning combat brigades into advisory brigades. So you could, you'll find these people, these advisors are in large numbers in units and well-trained and, and uh, able, if requested by the Iraqis, to take on military operations. And for a long, long time, the Iraqi military will need intelligence support, logistical support, and critically, air support. They're getting some F-16s and take some time to train pilots, but perhaps just as important or more important, uh, attack helicopters and training helicopter pilots and so forth is a more complicated process. So I think we'll have people around there.
all the time. Now, the violence is clearly down. That's, that's the good news. Uh, I see several reasons for this. Of course, some are obvious. Uh, the switch in Al Anbar, thanks to General Odierno and others, the sons of Iraq, uh, who realized that the more, their more dangerous enemy was Al Qaeda. That, that's pretty obvious. Secondly, uh, something some people talk about, but not too much. The fact is that in Baghdad, at least, and to some degree elsewhere, uh, the ethnic cleansing was between Sunni and Shia Arabs was mostly completed. If you look at maps of Baghdad before and after the, the violence that followed the Samarra bombing, you'll see uh, great differences. There are hardly any Sunnis east of the city, except for the religious, uh, around the religious shrine in Adamiya. And if you look west of the city, it's a bit more mixed, but it's heavily Sunni Arab, and many of the Shia have had to go west of the river because the, uh, the west part of the city then merges into Anbar province, which is solidly Sunni. So, uh, you know, sadly, the, the violence was down, which was good, but there were, most of the people had already been killed or driven out. Obviously, uh, bit by bit and now to a great extent the Iraqi forces are much better trained. Uh, uh, the government has become much more assertive. Uh, Mal Maliki, the Prime Minister, made some gambles uh, which he pulled off with a good bit of American help going into Basra and Sutter City and succeeded in getting rid of, of the militias. Uh, I th as I say with the violence going down I think national feeling has resurged to a degree I also think, because I, I was involved a long time in ending the civil war in Lebanon, and I, my conclusion then was uh, when you get that degree of, whether you want to call it civil war, ethnic cleansing, whatever you want to call it, this violent internal conflict, it's a little bit like a forest fire. When it reaches a certain level, you can't put it out anymore. You can only contain it and let it burn itself out. And I think. That's what happened in Lebanon, and you can see subsequently when there have been crises that uh, the Lebanese are very loath to get into that kind of violence again. And I, to a lesser degree, I would say in Iraq, you see that a lot of Iraqis are were sickened by the degree of violence and very loath to get involved in it, get involved in it again. So uh, the, there are, of course, the central government is working is working better. Also, the U.S. government has lowered its goals in Iraq, let's, let's be frank, and uh, there's less push from the government. But violence is down. That's, that's certainly a good thing. Uh, and there are, in future prospects, there are some uh, good signs. Certainly the uh, security forces are doing much, doing much better. Uh, the, uh, the municipal elections brought the Sunnis back into the process uh, to a significant degree. Uh, uh, Maliki himself has proved to be a much stronger and more effective uh, prime minister than anyone expected. Everybody thought he was really weak. There was, even, if you remember, the Hadley memo that leaked in the administration about thinking whether the U.S. government should try to get rid of him. Uh, if you, anyone who remembers Vietnam would realize that that wasn't such a great idea anyway. But uh, of course maybe he's proven to be a little too strong for some people and we can mention that in a minute. And in some areas, I think in many areas, reconciliation is proceeding. There's a lot of effort on the U.S. side. U.S. Institute for Peace has a lot of people out there really working on reconciliation, doing a, doing a great job. But uh, uh, another good thing, previously you had this Iraqi alliance, you had monolithic blocks. Now you're beginning to see the political situation breaking down. Maliki is taking advantage of this and making some deals with Sunnis and so forth, and he's managed to uh, split some of the other uh, Shia groups who, who previously were much more powerful than his own Dawa party. And so in the splintering, you see some cooperation along sectarian lines, which is, uh, which is, a, good, uh, which is a good sign, certainly. But, uh, you know, we're still not home by any means. Uh, there are a number of major dangers. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's a very good piece in the New York Times today, if anybody looked at it, a long list of the, uh, 
the situation I thought really said it very well, but here's my take on it anyway. One thing that's quite obvious is that Arab-Kurdish tensions have really risen. Uh, the Kurds, there is a legal entity which goes back to the Ba'ath called Iraqi Kurdistan, which has about three provinces, 10% of the countries. The, Iraq, the, the Kurds actually control about 17% of the country. And if you look at that little map, you can see their areas are considerably larger than Iraqi Kurdistan. Uh, some of these areas, uh, Accra, for example, in the north are solidly Kurdish. Others, like Diyala, are mixed. And of course, the really dangerous one is Kirkuk. The, the UN has come up with a proposal for a special administration, which strikes me as uh, long felt as the only possible solution that would, would, would neither be part of Iraq proper or part of Kurdistan, but under a special regime, maybe getting some kind of UN presence, but getting the four elements, the, the Kurds, the Turkmens, uh, the Christians, and the Muslim Arabs uh, all together and cooperating in a government. Uh, I know t this is an issue of particular concern to Turkey. Historically, I, th I think it's always been a mixed city, but maybe a hundred years ago when it was very small, certainly the biggest group was Turkmen. But as oil developed, Kurds flooded in from the countryside, and just to the east of Kurdistan you have mountains but full of Kurds. They came in and settled, and then became perhaps the largest single group. But, and then, of course, especially under the Ba'ath, they began pushing both Kurds and Turkmens out and bringing in first of only, mainly in the beginning, Shia Arabs, later some Sunni Arabs. Christians have always been there, although it's shrinking. So, and in a country with little history of tolerance and getting along with each other, this is indeed a, a very dangerous situation. Uh, so, but I think it's one area in which the uh, United States would intervene pretty drastically to, because the Kurds have their own army uh, right now. They, they might be something of a match for the Iraqi army, but I don't think with, with our influence over the Kurds and so forth, I don't think, and uh, still influence in the central government, I think we could prevent a conflict, but it is risky. Uh, second problem, of course, uh, the Anbar, the Sons of Iraq, they are not really in any significant number being integrated into the into the security forces, which t means there's a great temptation for some of these people to again take up arms, this time more against the government than against us and against Malki. Uh, the police and army are much better, but they're certainly not, especially the police are not entirely free of sectarianism. Malki has, seems to have been using some of the police for his own political goals, uh, using, uh, you know, offering the country has oil offering carrots, but at the same time arresting a number of Sunni leaders and, and trying to break up the sons of Iraq. Uh, Muqtada Sadr is still a force to be reckoned with. He's been lying low, but we don't know where they, uh, where they will come out. There is also, I mentioned very briefly, a strong historical split between the, the two families of Ayatollahs in Iraq, the Hakims who fled to Iran and fought on the Iranian side, and the Sutters with their large uh, charitable organization who stayed there and struggled and were murdered by Saddam, who, fe who feel that the Hakim faction and others betrayed the country and fought for the enemy. Uh, uh, many basic government issues have not been addressed. The oil law, for example, even though they're going forward with, with bidding on contracts, the oil law has not been pa passed. They still haven't settled with the Kurds how that would be done. The issues of federalism, uh, Maliki seems to be trying to roll, roll that back. Uh, and to the extent that people worry about Dick Maliki maybe eventually becoming almost a dictator, I think that's not very likely, probably. But down the road, as you build up these huge security forces, there's the fear that maybe 10 years down the road you might find yourself uh, with another general running the country. Uh, that, of course, is impossible to predict, but is not impossible. Uh, corruption is still extreme in Iraq and, and has very deleterious effects on the operation of the government. So there's still an awful lot to be done. Uh, my bottom line is minimalism. Uh, we still haven't won this by any means. Uh, 
uh, we, I think, have some moral obligations for the mess we've made and all the people who are dead because of the terrible mistakes we made in the beginning. But the really strategic argument to me is we do not want to have to go back to this country a third time. Uh, and we need to do everything possible, if we can, to leave something more or less functioning behind. There will certainly be a, a certain level of violence, and hopefully this, and likely this violence will not be of a degree which will uh, destroy or seriously threaten the stability of the government. We also need to be sure uh, that it, uh, less likely now, that it does not become so unstable and therefore a, a uh, another area where Al-Qaeda can continue to ma maintain a base and, and operate. Uh, there are other things we would like to achieve. We would like to have a democracy. We would like to have human rights. We would like to have women's rights. And we should try to encourage the Iraqis in that direction. But when it comes really down to the bottom line, these are desirable things we would wish to have. But the must-have is to try to have a functioning government that is not a source of instability in the region, is not a haven, not a haven for terrorists. I brought along Tom Rick's uh, new book, which is, I think, a great book, *The Gamble*, uh, and he has a, a, a very str striking ending line, and I think it's much along the lines of Ryan Crocker's view, you know, who've I, whom I've heard talk, and that he's, he says that. The things that we will remember Iraq for in this situation, that we remember them most for, have not yet happened. Uh, so that, that's kind of a thought-provoking uh, uh, ending of it. Uh, I, I recommend the Rick's book, and there's a great book by Ali Alawi, The Occupation of Iraq. Uh, the only Iraqi, really, to write a terrific book in English with an Arab perspective. And I think the beginning of the book, uh, the first 60 odd pages are really fantastically good if you have a chance to read it. Anyway, that's where I come out in this country. I hope we can achieve the minimum. We, we must try to do that, and I think we can. But uh, it's still too early to know what's going to happen, and I'm sure there'll be more crises before we get uh, to a reasonable solution of this uh, critical problem. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Uh, I'd like to ask you a question. I yeah. wonder if you'd talk a little bit, please, what you foresee as the long-term consequences of Iraq for the region. Uh, uh, the Bush administration went in trying to make Iraq an example, and maybe it did, but hmm. not in the way that it uh, wanted, I, at least initially. Uh, how do you see this affecting the region's development and U.S. relations with the Middle East over the longer term, say the next five years or so? Yeah, that's a good question and one very hard to answer, I think. I, my sense is we have a certain hope, especially among the, the military planners who are very good, that we can still have Iraq as kind of a de facto ally that because we will still be there, that they will be a source of support for our friends in the Gulf and uh, as a kind of a bulwark against Iran. I'm not at all sure of that at all. I think, uh, I don't take personally Sovereignty Day, uh, maybe some Americans do, but uh, the last few years have been very hard in Iraqi dignity. Uh, and we have caused an awful lot of suffering in this country. I think, in human terms, they, they have something to celebrate, although they may pay a certain price for it because we'll find out whether they're really ready to take it over. I think Iraq is going to be a difficult situation for us for the next few years. I don't think the political situation has settled down. Uh, we will learn a lot between now and uh, next January when we have the, the elections. Uh, the national elections where Iraq is going to hand. But I think we'll be fortunate if, if Iraq is not a problem in the area for us. Uh, but I think Iraq itself will be much too preoccupied, of course, to, to be a threat to anyone else. Uh, but if it can't control its borders, it's still going to have a lot of difficulty. Uh, the feelings between uh, Sunni and Shia are still there, I think. Uh, 
uh, Saudi Arabia is, is unlikely ever to be really reconciled with a Shia-led government in, in Iraq, and that's certainly what's going to happen, whatever the outcome, I think. And uh, uh, Jordan, it's, uh, or Jordan as well, but that's less of an issue, I think also feels that very strongly. So I don't, f I think the hope that it can be kind of our friend and partner in the region are, is too optimistic. I'd be satisfied with a more neutral outcome. <laughs> okay. I'd like to open the floor to questions, and would you please identify yourself uh, and give your name? Hi, uh, David Block. Thank you very much for speaking. Sure. Uh, can I get through your perspective on two different issues? One is, as the ambassador leads, what is your perspective on the unfall in Halal? As well as also what's going on in Iran right now. Part of the reason why we're not allowed, why we shouldn't be meddling or interfering in Iran, is because of our interactions with Saddam Hussein during the Iran-Iraq War. So, if you could get your perspectives as the ambassadors to Iraq at that time, yeah, when we're involved with Saddam Hussein. I would appreciate it. Thank you. Well, as far as right now, I think uh, the president has pursued just the right policy. I know it's very easy to try to meet the feelings of outrage in the United States and the West, but uh, to give the Iranians an excuse to blame this all on us, I think, would be, would be a serious mistake. And uh, yeah, I know he's under a lot of pressure, but I think he's, he's followed the right policy. Uh, I think we've also gotten a bit carried away with ourselves, uh, in a sense. Number one, my remembrance of Musavi, he's the man who's often been considered as the one who helped organize the, the bloody bombing of the marine barracks in Lebanon. And as prime minister under Khomeini, he was anything but a moderate. Now, I think he's, he's the symbol for a real division in, in Iranian society, and I think that's probably, from our American interest, a good thing, because it will make, I would hope, make the Iranians less adventurous and less difficult, but I don't think Musavi is a great is a great man on a white horse by by any means. So, I think that policy is is generally safe. As far as Unfall at Halabsha, uh, I left in July of '88. Uh, I remember it very vividly, the breakthrough. But uh, it was a very it was very difficult for us, any of us as diplomats in Iraq, to find out exactly what was going on. This was, I mean, this was a true police state, and it controlled everything. Uh, I had the assumption at the time, and I think that may be true, is it just, rather than so much punishing the Kurds, I think uh, Halabja really showed Saddam's total, uh, total disregard for human life and decency. I think he just plastered the place. And uh, we actually, in Radio Free Iraq, man had fled but interviewed the Brigadier General who was in charge of the Air Force Operations Room when they received the order to hit Talabsha with all available means, a code for using chemical weapons. Uh, it was pretty obvious what had happened in Halabsha. Uh, there was allegations at the time, and I just participated in a conference with Brown, a lot dwelt on this subject. There were some confusing allegations at the time that maybe the Iranians had used chemical weapons. I don't think there's any evidence for that. And there's not even, I'm, I'm not convinced, evidence that the Iranians ever actually used chemical weapons in the war. But if they did, I mean, they were way behind the Iraqis in the use. The, the use of the Iraqis was much greater. As far as Unfal was concerned, that was even more difficult. And, you know, uh, now the name Unfal means a lot. At the time, it was just another name because all of these campaigns had names. Uh, what had happened, uh, what we could see it happened, was that. Uh, Responsibility for the north of the Kurds had been taken over by Chemical Ali, Ali Hassan and Majid, who was, if anyone was more brutal than Saddam, it was Ali Hassan. And that uh, we, could, we could tell that whole villages were being depopulated and the people were being shipped off somewhere. But by the time I left, we didn't have any evidence of wholesale killings, although it was reasonable su to suspect there were at least some killings. But the, the 
the real information about Unfall, I think, came out after I left. But at the time, we were trying very hard to get information. We needed permission to travel up there. and uh, Under normal circumstances, we could travel, but uh, it, was, it was impossible at that point to get up, up around Halabsha and up into the Kurdish areas. But, it's, it's, but everybody knew that Saddam was an extremely brutal man and that if anybody opposed him, he would, he would eliminate them without, without any thought at all. The, the issue we discussed at Brown was an interesting one, is that is, why didn't the U.S. protest more strongly the use of chemical weapons, which is a reasonable question. All I can say is we tried, at least in Baghdad, to raise the issue whenever we could without any expectation that the Iraqis would respond. Uh, we did not pose it as a moral issue. That would have been a total waste of time. We opposed it as as a strategic issue because it actually had significance for the Cold War, the defense of Western Europe. If the, the bar was lowered for the use of chemical warfare, uh, that raised the risk that the Soviets would use it in an attack on Western Europe, and, and we were very convinced about that. What we did try to do with some success, uh, we were part of an informal group known as the Australia Group, which tried to cut off the precursors for the chemical weapons, the different chemicals. And all of these chemicals have legitimate uses, but when you see how they're being purchased, how they fit together, then you understand that they're not being used for pharmaceuticals or fertilizers and so <coughs> forth. They're being used to kill people. And we did have some success uh, in cutting off the chemical precursors, but the Iraqis were very skillful at buying one item, you know, in Belgium and one in Denmark or one in Germany, and a couple of times even managed to get them in the United States. Uh, the real issue was whether we should have made this such a big issue to that we should have stopped our support, whatever support we were giving to the Iraqis. And my personal view is, uh, no, I think the, uh, the issue of preventing Iraq, Iran from winning the war was the, was the dominant issue and the, we felt the chemical issue, but it was clear that we weren't going to be able to influence the Iraqi use of it, and that anything we did to punish Iraq would only harm our own interest in the region. Yes, man, back here, please. Uh, Abraham, I'm your uh, consultant for the American Turkish Council, mm -hmm. formerly the yeah, I'd like to ask you, Mr. Ambassador about the, the wisdom of uh, phasing out uh, American troops from, uh, from Iraq. You uh, made a comparison to Afghanistan. Uh, where are the strategic interests in, in Afghanistan? Why escalate in Afghanistan while phasing in, 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 in Iraq? And also about the long-standing, could you please comment about the long-standing concern that the Shiite from uh, Iran will join forces with the Shiite from Iraq to establish some hegemony. Uh, after you left uh, the, uh, the I guess the country, uh, there was an effort to capture uh, Kuwait. That precise uh, mm -hmm. speaker agreement of 1926 on the Iraqi regard as the 19th province of, 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 of Iraq. And if the uh, Shiites are able to establish hegemony with the Hezbollah in uh, in Lebanon and in Hamas in, 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 uh, in the Gaza Strip, uh, uh, that could have some spillover effect about the stability of the region and the region. Kuwait and maybe even so Saudi Arabia. So uh, again, uh, and also the Israelis of the U.S. phase out of Iraq, Israel will feel less secure and maybe less willing to negotiate in good faith. Uh, so uh, again, this idea of phasing out of Iraq with strategic interest of the oil reserves, as you correctly mentioned, uh, and escalating in Afghanistan. Uh, could you please comment on, yeah, on sure, the, sure. Of this of this strategy, please? Well, as far as phasing out in Iraq is, I think there's really no choice. Uh, the Iraqis want us to phase out, and the whole, and the fact is, our ground forces are, are being utilized at an unsustainable level. We cannot manage certainly both of these, both of these wars, and even Iraq, I think, in the long term is unsustainable. But in any case, the whole idea was to to prepare the Iraqis to run their own country, and they, given the history of the Middle East, I think that's the only feasible, the only feasible outcome you can seek. You can't keep Iraq under occupation, and uh, 
you have to let them eventually stand on their own feet and do it. The issue is, you know, the issue to debate, I think, is more the rate, the speed at which you're going. And I think, given the realities of what the Iraqis have done, we probably are pretty much at the right point. As far as Afghanistan is concerned, I think probably I'm not the only one to think that the chances for a successful outcome in Afghanistan are less than certainly than they are in Iraq. If, and if you look at some of those statistics and you see how much less well-developed Afghanistan is, uh, you realize, uh, and of course, you look at the, they have about the same arable land, but the rest of that land is, is easily traversable desert in Iraq. It's all mountains in Afghanistan. I spent October of 07 in Afghanistan with working for the State Department Inspector General, and it's, you know, it's a horrendous task. Uh, but uh, the issue there is can you, you know, this idea, can you split off the Taliban in some fashion from Al-Qaeda or split off the more reasonable, relatively more reasonable Taliban sympathetic Pashtuns? But the idea of getting a, s a functioning central government in, in Afghanistan for me is very hard to conceive. I mean, they've never had one. But if you can at least stabilize the country to a degree, uh, maybe maybe you can do something. But I think the outcome is very murky in Afghanistan. As far as the Shia are concerned, I think this idea of a Shia-led Middle East is, is greatly exaggerated. First of all, uh, the Shia Arabs in Iraq do not like Persians in general. Uh, now, there are many more ties now and sympathies, I think, between the two, but the, uh, the dislike and the divisiveness is still there. In the, while well, I was there in the Iraq-Iran War, at least 70 percent of the enlisted strength of the Iraqi army that was fighting fiercely against, uh, 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 against Iran, the 70 percent were Shia. And they viewed this as a national struggle, and they viewed the uh, the Iranians as a bunch of medieval fanatics. And the one thing they would not accept from the government was to portray this as a religious war. And this would come up because the, from time to time, uh, Saddam's <coughs> regime would try to force the families to bury their dead as martyrs, you know, not wash them and uh, bury them in their own blood. And this really infuriated the Shia. They, they said, this is not a religious war, this is a war against these alien Persians. The view, of course, is that the hordes of Central Asia start at the border with Iran. So, and as far as the, the Hezbollah is concerned in Lebanon, I see in many respects the Hezbollah is very Lebanese. Now they, they have ties, sure they have ties, and they have a, a major ayatollah in, in among the Hezbollah. But I don't think that, uh, especially under current conditions in Iran, that they have any prospect of, of running a kind of a joint Shia operation. Khomeini in the beginning, you remember, said he was starting an Islamic revolution and it was also for Sunnis. And then that didn't work and then he portrayed it as a Shia revolution. Uh, and then it deteriorated into an Iranian revolution. Uh, I don't see these people as getting together. The, uh, the Alawites are a very different breed in Syria. They don't have any particular uh, liking for uh, Hezbollah and others, except they have common interests. And for them, uh, they're fairly isolated in the Arab world, and for them, the, uh, the tie to Iran is a very important one. But if they could get a high enough price, they would give it up in a minute, I think. Uh, you could make a deal with the Syrians, but I don't, you would have a hard time meeting their price, I think. Yes, this gentleman here. Uh, thank you very much for your comments, Mr. Ambassador. I'm Mike Kurtzig. I used to work on the Middle East in the Department of Agriculture. Uh -huh. and I now teach. Oh, we got a couple of them. About, <laughs> about the Middle East. Number one, I agree with you 110% that the invasion of Iraq was one of the greatest foreign policy blunders sure. in American history. <laughs> And we knew it. Some of us knew it at the time. Most of us know it by now. I'm interested about the cost. I mean, our economy is suffering, and suffering substantially, I think partly because the Bush administration managed to hide the cost. Now, uh, I think we're coming out to the real cost of this, and the cost is uh, the current economic situation, among other things. 
So the question is, can we afford to stay in Iraq? Can we afford to stay in Afghanistan without uh, having even a deeper economic recession, possibly a depression here? Well, yeah, a good question. Uh, I remember the, uh, this is fairly early on, the former chief economist of the World Bank estimated the final cost would be three trillion dollars. Of course, this all depends on what you count. You're counting, but you're counting the long-term care of all these horribly wounded and soldiers. And we tend only to think about 4,000 odd dead in the American military. There are close to 20,000 wounded. Uh, and many of these, because of the nature of the war and the protection they had, many of these have brain injuries and so forth. And, and with all the other costs, you know, okay, maybe it's two trillion, not three trillion. It's still not uh, pocket change, that's for sure. Uh, Iraq is is going to be a lot less expensive for us uh, because the, uh, I mean, our development efforts and and many of the things we were paying for are now being paid for by the Iraqis. Uh, I don't think the money is so important as the strain it puts on the armed forces, especially on the Army and the Marine Corps, the ground forces. And of course, to a significant degree, as we're drawing down in Iraq, where these troops are going on to uh, Afghanistan. And one of the interesting things to me, I went, went to a two-day conference on Iran a couple of months back at the Marine Corps University. The degree to which the Marine Corps has taken ownership of Afghanistan. The Marines think that Iraq is the Army's war and the Mar and Afghanistan is going to be their war. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and of course the, Mar the Marine Corps is much smaller than the Army. There's also going to be, of course, an extra cost because we're talking about 30,000 more uh, people in the Army and I've got a smaller number for the Marine Corps. But I think, uh, yeah, certainly the, the cost is significant, but I think the strain on the military forces is even greater. Thank you. I have another question, yeah. David. Yeah. Uh, recently I had a conversation with a good friend of mine who's an Iraqi American. He's originally, his family's originally from Al Anbar, so you can imagine his politics and some of these. But he's now been in Iraq since sometime in 2003 as, a, as an advisor to the Iraqi government. He presented a very pessimistic view. Uh, basically, uh, the parliament uh, is unable to reach compromises. The constitutional yeah, reforms are right. stuck. Almost any bill right. that you would like to see is stuck. Uh, furthermore, there was the assassination recently of the Sunni uh, leader of the parliament. Yeah. Uh, there's no employment uh, for the uh, sons of Iraq, the Sawa, 90,000 of them were, uh, sought jobs or would like to have jobs, 5,000 of them are right. employed. Right. There is the uh, decrease in oil prices, which means in, in very short scan uh, that uh, there's, least, uh, there's less grease for the, greasy, uh, for the squeaky wheels, so there's less uh, lubrication here. Uh, the uh, Kurds are unhappy. Uh, and um, overall, he thought this all might come to a head in the course of the, par of the parliamentary elections on, in January of 2010. Uh, and furthermore, it would be complicated if the referendum about the so-called SOFA, the U.S. withdrawal agreement, is postponed or then because it'll all focus down to on U.S.-Iraqi relations. So bottom line, his six months prognosis or a little longer it's pretty bleak. Yeah, but yeah. those those are all legitimate worries. I mean, the situation is very bad in some areas and very difficult. The question is, is it difficult enough to bring the whole system down? I think one thing uh, I believe is, you know, the Shia did not wait 90 years or 80, 90 years to, to their, as the majority, to have the right to run the country, only to have it break up. I think they will try everything possible to keep it running, and will. And Maliki has shown that he's a, he's almost like a Lebanese politician. I mean, he's able to make remarkable compromises, and he's made some deals with uh, some members of the Sunni opposition. He's trying to keep the Sunnis from forming a, you know, a, a unified bloc. I think, uh, the, and the Iraqis are resilient. I think there'll be a, a good bit of violence. Uh, I don't. I just too soon to tell what the out, 
today's the last day of at least the U.S. ground combat presence in the cities. Uh, there'll be more violence, certainly. How bad it will be, we don't know yet. Uh, but I think there's a reasonable prospect that as bad as the situation might get, that the Iraqis can keep it together. And that's what I say, we should be minimalist. Uh, we just want it to stay together, we'd be able to function and not become a haven again for Al-Qaeda. And everything else is, falls in the would like to have category, not must have. I, you know, we'll see. Uh, but as, you know, as he says, uh, Ryan Crocker, I've heard talk says the thing we need in Iraq is, quote, strategic patience, unquote. <laughs> uh, we're going to have to have a lot of patience, and we're going to see a good bit of violence. The question is, can they survive it? And I think there's a reasonable chance at least they could. I think there's time for one more question. Terry, yeah. Gentlemen. Yeah. Thank you very much, David. Terry Waltz, is this on? Yes. Terry Waltz, uh, Washington, D.C. Um, you, th this talk is labeled as a personal view of Iraq, and uh, I was just wondering if we could get a little insight into mm -hmm. your own personal experience when you went to Iraq in 1984 as ambassador. What, what were the chief interests of the United States at that time? And uh, looking back on them, how, how, do, you think, um, how do you think they fared? Um, I wonder if you could just give us a little bit of in insight into what American interests were in 1984. Okay, uh, that's sure. Well, I guess my first impressions, and for the for what come out was number one, impressed by the organization and hardworking attitude of the Iraqi people, and number two, this was absolutely the most despicable, worst dictatorship. You know, as one book called it, the Republic of Fear. I mean, I've never been a, I've been, there are plenty of security forces, terrible security forces in the Arab world, but I've never seen one like the Iraqis. They were really bad. But our interests were basically two. The short-term overriding interest, make sure Iran didn't win the war. And we, we succeeded in that, uh, you know, and find the Iran collapsed. Uh, and uh, we didn't have to send troops over to do it. We managed to do it through, through a political means, through intelligence. And, and uh, we also had a hope, at least, and, and some prospect that since Iraq, when they resume relations, uh, Tariq Aziz said that the phrases, uh, the words he used about his government, he said, he talked about maturity, responsibility, and realism as hallmarks of the regime. And what I said to people is, there's another R, respectability. As I said, what Saddam wanted was respectability, not to be seen as the bomb thrower anymore, but as the great leader of the Arab world, of the non-aligned movement. Uh, and I mean, the cult of personality there, when I, when I came there, one of my colleagues said, second only to Kim Il-sung, but I think <laughs> he gave Kim Il-sung a good bride for his money. <laughs> so, you know, so we hoped that, and Saddam was showing signs of this, that he, number one, he would uh, behave in a more responsible way in the Middle East, and he would stop encouraging subversion and terrorism, and that although the nature, the fundamental nature of the regime wouldn't change, that he would ease up on his own people because there was no opposition, any potential opposition. And as you remember, in the 1980s, we weren't into regime change. You know, we were not, there was no prospect of changing this regime. So the only feasible course of action was to try to get him to behave more responsibly. And I used to com compare it like, Gulliver and Lilliput. You remember <laughs> Gulliver is tied down by the Lilliputians with all these strings? Well, we were, we were trying all kinds of strings, we and the Europeans, that would maximize the incentive for Saddam to behave responsibly and increase the cost of behaving irresponsibly. And we, you know, we benefited. We sold a billion dollars worth of agricultural commodities every year. Uh, and uh, we, people accused us of giving aid. This, the only people who really benefited from this aid were U.S. farmers. And we did 
lend him a limited amount of money on short-term credits, which he was repaying regularly. So it wasn't costing anything really to us. Uh, and it was keeping the Iranians, and you know, the Iranians of, of, of the 1980s are not the same as they are now. The Khomeini had a extremely hostile, expansionist, nasty regime, which, for which, uh, about which we were very worried, and we were very worried particularly about Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and the Gulf. And that's really why we were trying to make sure that the, that the Iraqis didn't lose the war. And they, they couldn't win the war, and the and the in military terms, and the Iranians couldn't lose the war, but we wanted to force the Iranians to give up, and eventually they did. David, thank you very much Pleasure. for Pleasure. an extremely interesting and insightful personal view. Thank you for the very good questions. Thanks, and Ollie. Thank you.